Doubts will come. Faith will be tested. God will seem to be far away. Our shortcomings and failures will eventually rise up so that our hearts condemn us. And when our hearts begin to condemn us, we better know how to practice the spiritual discipline of telling ourselves the truth because our hearts will need to be reassured. That's John's point in 1 John chapter 3. Do you have your Bibles? Can I see them? Wave them at me, will you? Wonderful. Join me in 1 John chapter 3. We'll finish the chapter today. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 19. In a message I'm calling, that's reassuring. Simply how to know how to reassure yourself when your own heart condemns you. So let me just remind you as you turn to 1 John chapter 3, that however firmly grounded the Christian assurance is, From this text, we'll find out that sometimes we all need assurance. 1 John chapter 3 and beginning at verse number 19. And as always, I need to tell you that the best communicator of God's word in the world is imperfect. The best preacher, and I don't claim to be it, but the best preacher in the world is imperfect. But the text of God's word never lies. It is fully and completely trustworthy. It is the lamp under your feet and the light under your path. It's the truth you need in your heart today. Watch this. John says, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. That Greek word literally means in his presence. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the Bible formula for how you should address the anxiety that comes from your own heart. What is the antidote to self-condemnation? First of all, in verses 19 and 20, I want you to see the reassurance of faith. This may be one of the strongest and best definitions of faith in all of the Bible. Are you listening to me? Faith is simply taking God and his word for what they are in spite of how my feelings and circumstance may be speaking to me. Are you tracking with me, church family? Faith is saying, I believe God even when my heart is condemning me, even when my feelings betray me. Do you see what he's presenting here? He's presenting what may be your biggest battle of all. The biggest battle may not be with the devil. I tell people all the time, your biggest battle isn't the devil. He doesn't even know your name. They look at me like I'm a liar. No, I believe there is a real devil. His name is Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub. He's somewhere in the world, but he is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at once, and he probably doesn't have you in his crosshairs because he's got bigger targets to be concerned about. I often think to myself, he didn't mess up my life, I did. And that's a biblical truth. My heart is the problem. Was J. Siddle Baxter used to say, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And this text says, your heart will condemn you. Your heart will condemn you. That's like having a terrorist on the inside of your body telling you you're no good. You're not saved. You don't belong to God. He can't possibly love you. So what do you do? You respond in faith. What is faith? I believe God and his word even when my feelings are telling me otherwise. Isn't it interesting? Even the great king of Israel, David himself, said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. This is the man who wrote much of the Psalms, who faced the giant Goliath, who slew the lion and the bear with the jawbone of a donkey, for goodness sakes. He's a mighty warrior, and he said, but the battle with my own heart overwhelmed me. And, and I grew anxious because of it. Interesting, David says, I have an overwhelmed heart. This text, of course, is saying that we have hearts that condemn us. Accuse us, maybe, is another word that we could, we could use in, in this text. Of course, Jesus took the whole 
the whole concept of the heart and liken them to soil. So the word is sown into the soil of the human heart. And he said some of them are shallow, some of them are rocky, some of them are thorny. But one out of the four that hear the word of God will have soft hearts. Be like soil that's been worked with, with fresh nutrients and it's all stirred up and the seed is planted. And it begins to take root. So that's a, a, a soft and tender heart. We learned last week, by the way, that you can have a closed heart. A closed heart is when you see a brother in need and you have the wherewithal to meet that need and you turn a blind eye and shut your heart off to feeling his need. That's a closed heart. Do you have a closed heart? Or is your heart open? Would you say as God Almighty looks down upon your life, he sees in the center of your being that that central core of your personality is why the door is wide open saying, have at it, God. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. See what all is there and teach me how to walk in your way. Or would you, would you even mitigate God's presence in your heart? Do you, have you opened your heart to him? You can only be spiritually healthy if you open your heart. You've got to open your heart to him to let him do his great work. So it's a real, it's a real battle, the battle with the human heart. I have not tried to help many people spiritually that in the end I had to say, my, they're arrogant. They really think very, very highly of themselves. Now, let me assure you, I have met a few of those people. But by and large, the people that I talk to to try and help them spiritually, I soon discover that they are their own worst critic, that their own heart continues to condemn them. They can't possibly see themselves in the light that God sees them, which is with the love of God, the eternal, unconditional love of God. Most people struggle to imagine that God could even sing and dance over us, as Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says. When was the last time your heart heard the music? When God looking down upon you, according to Zephaniah 3, and he wrote a love song, about you. See, our hearts condemn us, don't they? Make it hard for us to simply take God at his word. That's the biggest battle. But this text also gives us the weapons to slay the battle of a condemning heart. And it's two things. It's simply remembering the presence of God. I've gotten myself through more than a few heart-wrenching situations not because I felt God's presence, but because I chose to believe it because he said it. And if he said it, whether I feel it or not, he's there. And what does he say? Here's how you reassure your hearts in his presence or before him. What is he trying to tell you? He's simply trying to say, when your heart condemns you, you need to have a conversation with yourself. And you need to say, heart, I don't feel God's presence. I don't see God's presence. I wonder about it. But he is there because I believe in the character of God. He cannot lie. You see, a child of God believes the Father even when he can't see it and prove it and feel it. Are you tracking with me, family? Somebody say we're tracking, Derek. <laughs> say this is good stuff, Derek. <laughs> yes, it is good stuff. Not because I'm preaching it, but because it's in the word of God. The word of God is telling you, when you feel like God has abandoned you and you are all alone, you tell yourself the truth. And the truth is, where shall I flee from your presence? David wrote in Psalm 139, if I, if, if I scale the heights of the universe, you are there. If I plumb the depths of hell, you are there. God's presence is everywhere, but especially with his children especially with his children. That's why Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end, uh, even to the end. That's pretty good. So when it's time for you to, to leave this world and go to the next, that's going to be a great day, people. Trust me, it's going to be a great day. He's going to, it's Jesus who's going to reach down and just close your eyes and, you, and, and open, and you're going to open them in his presence because he will not forsake you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. No, never. He can't. He's going the distance with you. You see, so how do I reassure my heart when it's condemning me and the anxiety is, is on the rise? By faith. And faith is to say, I believe God's presence is with me. Here's what I like to tell people. Invited or not invited, God is with you. You don't have to say, come on in, God. You live as his permanent guest. 
You don't invite him. He invites you because he is everywhere present all the time, everywhere, in every circumstance. Isn't that cool? I look back down the corridor of my life and say, boy, I sure wasn't convinced of it, but it was true nonetheless. Now, in other words, the second thing that he tells us we're supposed to trust in faith. We trust God's promise that he is present with us, and we trust his character. He says, when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. So he's saying, when your heart is lying to you, believe the truth about who God is. God is good all the time. He cannot lie. He has your best at heart, and he, in the end, will make you more than an overcomer. I believe that when the world falls apart. I will not bow. I will not break under the pressure of of my own circumstance going mad because God is greater than my heart and he knows everything. You can't read this verse without feeling. He knew the kind of heart you had when he called you as his son or daughter. It was all naked and open before him to whom we give an account. He didn't look down and say, now that's him. He's a good man. <laughs> he looked down and said, ay, 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 what a dark and sinful heart. But I love him. And I'm going to save him. And I'm going to, because God is greater than my heart. Aren't you glad God is greater than your heart? I, I'm thankful that he's given you the beautiful heart that you have, but God is greater than your heart so that when it rises up to accuse you, you can say, he knows everything. He knew where I came from. He knows what I am. He knows my evil thoughts. Even now, he knows them all. What does he do? I love you, he says. So the first response, the first ingredient to reassuring your own heart is faith. Number two, it's prayer. That's in verses um, 21 and 22. It's the reassurance of prayer. Did you notice how carefully he stepped from this statement about our hearts condemning us to, but if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence in prayer, and we know that whatever we ask, we receive from him, because he's continuing the same overall thought. He's not recommending prayer only when we feel confidence. He's actually recommending prayer as an antidote to our hearts condemning us. He's saying, when in doubt, pray. When you're not sure, ask God to show you. When you don't have wisdom, seek him and he'll give it to you. This is what the text is. It's prescribing prayer as a means of healing my own heart. Isn't that cool? You don't need the preacher, the pastor, the elders. You just need to go to God directly and tell him about what's on your heart that you're struggling with doubt, you're feeling condemned, you're hurting and lonely, and he hears that prayer, and he answers that prayer. Let me say it again, when in doubt, pray. How do I know that? Because Jesus, knowing what was coming in the despair of the cross, he felt the weight beginning to shove its way into his heart. The despair was beginning to squeeze in the center of his chest. What did he do? He allotted a period of time to pray. Why? Because he knew that the enemy would come with accusation after accusation after accusation, and he wanted to reassure his heart that he was doing the right thing. How did he do it? He did it in prayer. If you get to go to Israel, the one place you don't miss is the Garden of Gethsemane. They think it's the original garden because the Olive trees that are there are approximately 2,000 years old. It was the most sacred spot for me to walk around in the Holy Land to think of my Lord in that moment before the cross wrestled with the condemnation and anxiety of his own heart as his mind and heart wrestled together. He knew the will of God. He knew what was right, but his heart was telling him of all the despair and anguish that was about to come. How did he overcome that? He won the battle in the garden. That's Jesus. I don't understand the mystery of the incarnation, but I'm telling you, don't you demean his humanity. In his humanity, he felt the darkness that he wrestled with in the garden, so much so that he sweat drops of blood. It was so horribly intensive. At that moment that he began to sweat drops of blood, what was he doing? He was praying through the times when his heart was struggling. 
It's what he was doing. A few years back, I did a course called, I think it was called Personal and Ministry Development with the then president of Briarcrest uh, Bible Seminary in Caronport, Saskatchewan. I'm drawing a complete blank on his name. I can see his face. And he assigned a paper to us uh, to, to basically examine the Psalms and look at them with a new set of honest eyes about what David was really saying about the state of his heart before God. I wrote in my paper, I think David was clinically depressed on multiple occasions. He wrote some of the most graphic, vulnerable, transparent stuff a man will ever hear. It wasn't a mistake because God included it in Holy Scripture. Here's David saying, in distress, I called out to the Lord, and he heard me. You know, most of us know, of course, that the Psalms are considered the Hebrew hymn book. They sing the Psalms. What we don't know is that it was also their prayer book. It wasn't just their hymn book. It was their prayer book. They sang their prayers to God, and they did so with uncharacteristic honesty. Good land. I don't know the last time I heard somebody pour out their soul to God in all of its ugly misery. But that is a biblical reality, a truth that every child of God is permitted to do in the presence of God in prayer. Prayer is one surefire way to reassure your heart when you become the worst condemner of yourself. Number three, the reassurance of obedience. He talks about prayer, and on the heels of talking about prayer, he talks about obedience. The thing I'm afraid about when I preach on obedience is that people will hear me like a big mouth fundamentalist preacher with a long bony finger telling you, just do what God told you to do, dummy. But that is not obedience at all. And you'll never find it in your Bible. I'll come back to that in a moment. But I do need to tell you that there are plenty of times in my Christian life where the only way I got through was by sheer obedience because God told me to do it. I didn't feel like it, I didn't want to do it, and I struggled, but I knew I had to do it, or I would die. I might lose my spiritual life if I didn't do what I was supposed to do. But I'm telling you, that should be the exception, not the rule. The rule, according to John, is that when I obey him, I'm doing it because I want to please him. Just as a husband who loves his wife buys the flowers, the candy, the dresses, whatever else your honey wants, it's not to pacify her, I hope, It's because you delight to see her happy reaction to your love being bestowed upon her. That's exactly what John is talking about here. He's saying, yes, we are motivated to obey God, and we should obey God. Sometimes we have to do it out of the sheer power of, of, of our will to do what God's told us to do. But the fact of the matter is the motivation in the heart of the Christian is that we want to honor him, to please him in all things. We want to know that the God who loved us first and has placed us in his son with whom he is always pleased, therefore he is pleased with me. He's already pleased with me. Do you see that? You're not trying to pacify God. By the gospel, he's moved you into a permanent place of being pleased. He's pleased with you. He likes you, he loves you. He's accepted you, you're in, all in forever. So because he's given me this gift, it just delights me to do what, what will honor him. That's the right motivation for obedience, isn't it? I learned the other way and practice it a lot of times, just for show, just to look like a good Christian, just to sound like a good Christian. God knows full well that my heart's not in it. And he says, I really, you know, let's just wait on this. <laughs> let's just put this off till a little bit later. Now, what I absolutely love about obedience is that he says, we obey to please God, which Jesus said, by the way, I always do the things that please him. I asked him last night, get me to the place where I can say that. Because I know I can't say I always do it. But I'm striving toward it, Right? as I grow in Christ. But here's what he says. There are two simple steps to pleasing God. To believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another. 
If you do those things, you're ple- God's pleased with you. That's uncomplicated. A five-year-old can understand it. The first thing that pleases the heart of God swells his heart with joy. His favor is shining upon us when we say, I believe in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, believing, as far as I understand, means that a person takes appropriate time to investigate the biblical claims of Jesus Christ. Believing is to take a long, hard look at the facts about who Jesus is and come to the conclusion he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He died a cruel death on the cross and he came back from the grave. And I believe it unreservedly. I accept it fully and completely. No reservations at all. Kind of like, forgive the illustrations. Jerry, if you don't mind, I take my honey in my arms and I often say to her, I believe in you. I believe in you. With every cell in my being, I believe in you. I know who you are. I know what you're about. And everything I know, I accept. My heart is committed, open, devoted. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. You say, well, I did that when I was saved. Come now. Believing in Jesus Christ is as vital in a Abundant spiritual life 50 years after salvation as when you start. Because everything about your Christian life is dependent upon your relationship with Jesus. He's your elder brother. He's your elder brother. So I'm believing in the... When I say to to God, I believe, he says, I'm pleased. Good for you. That's what I want. The second thing is, he says that you love each other. How simple is this? Believe in the name of the Son of Jesus, His Son Jesus Christ, and love one another. We're going to talk about this several times in the book of 1 John. It's a prominent theme in his writings, but he says you can't claim to believe in Jesus and be indifferent toward the people who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Say, We heard you, Derek. Wasn't very enthusiastic, was it? (laughs) Say, We heard you, Derek. Let me say it again just in case you didn't hear me. Don't you dare profess to believe in Jesus and be indifferent to the people who are sitting around you in this church this morning. If you say you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you are living detached from his church, this one or another one, I don't care which one, but you must be in a church. You cannot live an isolated Christian life. You cannot practice ecclesiology on your own. You must be in a community called a local church where you are accountable to the elders and they to you. And we are believing God's word and tracking together with the spirit of God and taking this church where he wants it to be. You can't say you believe in Jesus and disregard his family, his church. Lo and behold, we try it all the time. There are people who do that. I believe in Jesus. Next question, where do you go to church? I don't go to church. I mean, no, no, no. Baloney. Baloney according to the Bible. This text says so. It's one of those, hey, listen, to be fair, there are times when I was sick and tired of you. I don't mean you, I mean the church. The times I wanted to walk away, because we misbehave. We're just as sour as any other club in the world, and we are. So I've adjusted my expectations, the fact that we are human beings, and whenever you put human beings together in family, they fight. My family fights. We had a fight recently. It was in a restaurant. <laughs> we were arguing about something, we, got a little, we all get a little animated. At some point, somebody will call somebody a name. <laughs> and in the end, we laugh. We embrace. And when my family stood up to leave the restaurant, I was overcome with gratitude to God. I thought, what a beautiful family God has given me. Are they perfect? Not on your life, because their father is not. But we are a family. And we're going to stick together through thick and thin. Nobody gets booted out. Nobody gets disowned. Everybody is loved with the patience and grace that God has bestowed upon them. That's a family. 
This is one of the twins in the Bible. Believing in love, grace and peace is another one of those twins. James has a twin. Faith without works is dead. So let me move on. You've been so great at listening this morning. Let me show you the last one. This is, so my heart rises up to condemn me. I'm feeling anxious and I'm doubting God's favor and love upon my life. What do I do? I respond in faith. I go to prayer. I obey what he told me to do. Whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to do it because I want to please him. And then fourthly and lastly, the last verse in the text is simply uh, the reassurance of relationship. Watch this now. You say, well, how can you be sure that you have relationship if you're in a state of doubting? Let me show you in this text. I'll show you how it happens in our heart. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God abides in him. By this, here's the third time he uses the word abide. That's a very important word in the first century. Uh, Probably, prominently, it was used as a word that spoke about sharing the same lodging, living in the same house, But more than that, it was an emphasis upon the hospitality given to the guest who has come to live in the house. It's God's house. We're his guest. He's hospitable toward the people who come. God is the one who meets you at the door as the greeter and says, come on in. Dinner's on. Your bedroom's ready. Make yourself at home. You belong here. That's the idea in the word. How do we know that we're sharing that kind of relationship? I'm getting to that. That word abide means to lodge, to to dwell together. But of course, Jesus took the word and used it to speak of dwelling so closely, so intimately, that you're like a branch on the trunk of a tree and you're drawing your vital spiritual life from the source who is Jesus. That's how close we live together, Jesus and I. Well, he's living on inside of me by the Holy Spirit, isn't he? But the word meant more than that. It, it simply means to continue in any given activity. It means to hold fast against opposition. And in a legal way, it meant to keep an agreement that you struck with someone. The whole idea is going the distance. You see that? Watch now. As I look at my own spiritual journey, there have been highs and, oh, there have been lows. There have been ups and there have been downs. There are times when I was on the mountain, so to speak, filled with joy and excitement about the future. Then there were other times I've lived in the valley and I've walked for a long way in the wilderness and I wondered if God was even with me. But now as I look back, I say, ah, ah, even when my heart was broken, I was crying out to him, Father, I still love you. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm thankful that you love me. And I look back and say, there's every earthly reason for this relationship to have failed, but it has not failed. It has continued. There's another part to the verse that I think completes his thought. How do we know we abide in him? By his Holy Spirit that he's given to us. Now, if you're thinking at all, you've got to say, oh, come on. Now, how does... The invisible Holy Spirit helped me to understand that I'm in the family of God and I'm walking with God and he's walking with me. Even when my heart condemns me, even when my heart tells me otherwise, because in the mix of all that is the Holy Spirit, listen carefully, who according to Romans 8 says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The question is, what is he bearing witness? What is he saying? Paul answers it. It's the spirit by which I'm able to cry what? Abba. Abba, Father. See, through all the losses of my life, through all the tragedies, through the highs and lows, the one thing that keeps inserting and asserting itself in my heart is is a propensity to call out to God, Father, Father. I realized the other day, every time I say that, the Holy Spirit has been witnessing to my heart that I'm a child of God. When I look God in the face, I bow my head in prayer and call him Lord, Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit has witnessed to me that I am a child of God. 
So how is my heart reassured before him? Because there is a motivation, a prompting, an impulse, and an urge in my heart that does not originate with me that keeps reaching out to God as my Father to know him in a deeper way in relationship. So when my heart's telling me all the lies that it will, I'm listening most of all for the other voice, the other voice of the Holy Spirit to say, he's your papa, he's your daddy, he's your Abba. And my heart, divided and broken, is miraculously calmed and at peace. I'm where I need to be. Two simple conclusions. The first is, there are many people in this room this morning that need to be reassured that they are indeed a child of God. And I've given you the antidote to condemnation. There's some of you that belong to God in this room and you're struggling with condemnation and doubt. You're fearing that you don't belong to the Lord. This text says there are many of God's great children that doubt their assurance and this should reinsert it in your life. There are many more of you in this room that actually need to be resisted that you are in fact not a child of God. And you're not a child of God because you've had some religious high. You say, well, that's awful mean to say, Derek. No, it isn't mean at all. It's love. That's the greatest loving thing anybody could say to you. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, do we not, did we not know you? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Many in that day. The wheat and the tares will grow together in this church. And some of you don't need to be told that you are a child of God because you're not. And it's not my place to tell you you are or you're not, nor is it anybody else's. Eternal life, it was Billy Graham that used to say, the cross has a single file line. You must come by yourself to face Jesus Christ. Nor is it my place to reassure you that you are a child of God. You need to settle that in prayer and contemplation and quietness before the Lord until your heart has all that confidence that it needs. Would you let me pray for you? If ever I have felt, Lord, that I'm standing on the precipice it is right now. I'm so conscious that anything I say could be used by the enemy to confuse the minds of men. So I ask you please to protect the hearers of your word today so that the enemy cannot steal the seed of the truth away. And I pray that you would come instead. I don't fear him more than I fear you or trust you. I believe that you will show people their true state before you. You want it more than anyone in this room wants it, Lord. And so I pray for those who belong to you but are in a period of condemnation where their heart's condemning them, they're confused and conflicted. They need to know, oh God, they need to know. Please come, reassure their hearts before you that they have been indeed born again, saved by the blood, whatever word it is, whatever biblical word it is, Lord, help them to know that their relationship with you as God their Father has been reconciled and restored. And then I plead earnestly, humbly, for the people who are in this room that have made the mistaken notion that they have been saved but are not, open their eyes, O oh God, Lead them to do something about it immediately. And that something is opening their heart to you and coming in repentance for their sin and faith in Jesus Christ. And then for the rest of us, make us the kind of people that believe in the name of the Son of God and love one another, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.